Why am I talking about abstract and concrete labour? Well, two reasons. One, a question about it came up at the Historical Materialism Conference earlier this month, where I was giving a talk on planned economy and the use of labour values for that. And someone said, oh, why are you talking about using labour values in a socialist economy? Uh, because abstract labour will no longer exist under socialism. Now that seems such a misleading idea and at the same time such a common idea that it's probably worth talking about it and seeing why it's wrong. Now when you actually read capital as opposed to commentators on capital you'll see that the issue of abstract and concrete labour is a relatively minor one for Marx. It's dealt with in a very few clear paragraphs at, right at the start of the book. Unfortunately, over recent decades, it's become somewhat mystified and some people are putting out claims to the effect that abstract labour only exists in capitalist economies, socialist economies only have concrete labour, or even that there's no division of labour in non-capitalist economies. These ideas are so far from uh, what Marx said that it's, I have difficulty understanding how anyone comes by them. Now, what's the context of this discussion? It arises when Marx is talking about what a commodity is and what value is. And he traces this to something that is in common to all commodities. The physical properties of commodities that are exchanged on the market differ. And there are lots of different commodities which might have the same value, but they all physically differ. So there must be something they have in common. And he says, if we leave out to consideration the use value of commodities, they've only one common property left, that being pro products of labour. And this is the stage in his argument where he deduces that being products of labour is the source of value. And this is the basis of value, that all commodities have been made by people and wouldn't exist without the work of people. Now, when we ask how much is something worth, we're not concerned with the physical properties of a commodity, says Marx. If we make abstraction from its use value, we make abstraction at the same time from the material elements and shapes that make the product as a use value. We see it no longer as a table, a house, yarn, or any other useful thing. Its existence as a material thing is put out of sight. Now this has implications for what we mean by a commodity being a product of labour because we're no longer concerned with the physical properties of the commodity, only the fact that it's worth something. Nor can it any longer be regarded as the product of the labour of the joiner, the mason, the spinner or any other definite kind of productive labour. Along with the useful qualities of the products themselves, we put out of sight both the useful character of the various kinds of labour embodied in them and the concrete forms of that labour. There is nothing left but what is common to them all. All are reduced to one and the same sort of labour, human labour in the abstract. Now this is where he introduces the term human labour in the abstract. And he only uses it a few times and it's used right at the beginning of his book. Now, what do we get from this? The key thing is it must be human work. It's human work that creates value. If we consider commodities in general, bearing in mind that they exchange with one another, it can't be the specific character of labour or the labour that made them that's important. It's the fact they're all made by human labour. It says human labour in the abstract. To emphasise for him that it's people doing this, whatever the people were doing. But what about us, say the horses? Well, if they could speak. Don't we work? Don't we work even harder than you? In Marx's day, when he was writing, there were 
estimated to be around 3 to 3.3 million horses working in Britain. There were 21 million people. Not all of them were of working age, though the working age was much younger in those days. And horsepower is 735 watts. A human working hard is hard put to put out 75 watts, an adult man. So a horse is equivalent to about 10 people in terms of the work it can do. So the horses were putting a lot more work in than the people were when he was writing. But he's, he's not saying the source of value is the effort of horses. He's saying it's the effort of people. But what of the steam engine? Steam engine says we're as strong as 100 men. What about us? We put the horse to shame. Why are we not a source of value? Now Marx is emphatic. It's only humans that are a source of value. Machines don't create value. Machines only pass it on to the extent that human labour goes into them. I say He doesn't actually say this of horses, but in his analysis, horses are what he calls constant capital. They just pass on the, their price, the price that was paid for them in the beginning, to the product. Now, if we look at what the horse is, what the steam engine's doing, it was just pulling and turning. The work of our equine sisters was all traction. Horses weren't spinning. They weren't engaging in cabinet making. They weren't machining. There was no horse labour in the abstract. Because it was always of the same sort. They just pulled things, or at best carried riders. And all that steam ever did was turn a wheel. And that turning only became useful under human guidance. It didn't itself produce things. Now, having abstracted from the concrete form in which labour is in, exerted, what's left? How then is the magnitude of this value to be measured, says Marx? Plainly by the quantity of the value-creating substance, the labour contained in the article. The quantity of labour is measured, however, by its duration, and labour time, in its turn, finds its standard in weeks, days and hours. Now, there is actually a, a close match in this sense between labour and labour power and value on the one hand and horses, horsepower and energy on the other hand. In physics, energy is power applied for a given period of time. So you measure energy, for example, in kilowatt hours. So a horse working for an hour delivers about 0.75 of a kilowatt hour. A human working physically for an hour delivers about 0.75 of a kilowatt hour. Sorry, 0 0.075 of a kilowatt hour. The relationship between value and energy is parallel, but energy isn't value. It actually has to be human activity that creates value. Since time is the measure, the important thing to understand about commodities is that they're all produced by people working. You don't add up the number of hours that the horses worked. You don't add up the number of hours that the steam engines worked. And it's because we're not concerned about exactly what people were doing that we can measure labour in units of time. And this measurement in units in time would be true whatever the social relations were. We've still got a fixed population at any given moment in time, and they're only able to work for a certain number of hours in the day. 
And that is the basic malleable productive resource that society has. The difference is that horses, as I said, can only pull. Humans are adaptable. Humans can do work in the abstract because they can lend their hand to a wide variety of tasks. And that's why it makes sense to talk about human work in the abstract and not horse work in the abstract. Now, when economists talk about the division of labour, and it doesn't start with uh, Marx, Smith and Ricardo are talking about the division of labour. It's obviously human labour in general that is being divided between specific trades. Because when you talk about dividing labour, you're abstracting from the trades into which it is being directed. But the claim that some monks make that abstract labour and the division of labour are something specific to capitalism doesn't follow. It's, it's purely circumstantial, their argument. The fact that Marx raises these points in an analysis of capitalism. But that doesn't follow that it is only in capitalism that there is such a division of labour. In fact, he says quite the opposite. In Just on from the passage dealing with abstract labour, he says, the division of labour is a necessary condition for the production of commodities, but it doesn't follow conversely that the production of commodities is a necessary condition for the division of labour. In primitive Indian communities, there is a social division of labour without the production of commodities. Or to take an example near a home, in every factory, the labour is divided according to a system. But this division is not brought about by the operatives mutually exchanging their individual products. Now, these are an important pair of distinctions he's drawing there. He's drawing distinctions from the everyday and from the, the relatively foreign to the, the British, the primitive Indian communities, but these are to make a point. This is to make a point that you can have a division of labour in society as a whole run according to a plan. In the primitive Indian community, the division of labour is regulated by custom. In the factory, it's regulated by a constant, uh, a conscious plan. In a communist system, you would have division of labour at the level of society, regulated by a conscious plan. The important point of these two illustrations is to show that you don't need commodity production in order to have a division of labour. Division of labour continues. There's every reason to suppose that a division of labour and therefore human work in the abstract will also exist in communist societies, even if there was no commodity production in them. Now, we may hope that in communist societies we'll tend to free people from a narrow subordination to this division of labour so that people can vary their tasks either during the week or from year to year or during their lifetime. Uh, this is what Marx says on that. In communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can be accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, to fish in the afternoon, to rear cattle in the evening, criticise after dinner, just as I have a a mind without ever becoming a hunter, fisherman, herdsman or critic. So here he is saying that you can have a division of labour but it doesn't mean permanently allocating individuals to particular activities. The fact that one person can do different concrete tasks at different times abolishes neither the division of labour nor abstract labour, as Marx points out in Capital. Again, slightly on from the, uh, a few paragraphs on where, from where he first mentions abstract labour, he says, there are, however, states of society in which one and the same man does tailoring and weaving alternately, in which case these two forms of labour are mere modifications of the labour of the same individual, 
are not a special and fixed functions of different persons, just as the coat which make which our tailor makes one day and the trousers he makes the other imply only a variation of the labour of one and the same individual. So here he's saying that the division of the tailor's labour in the abstract into coat making and trouser making can occur without the, the tailor having to be a specialised coat maker or a specialised trouser maker. The key points here Abstract labour is a concept relating to the division of labour and it's the division of social time and this division exists in all human societies where there is any form of cooperation. What does change is who does the work, for whose benefit and whether the individual worker can change and develop through their life. Now I think something to take away from this is that it's best if people read Marx first. I'm not quite sure where the prejudice against abstract labour only existing under capitalism has come from, but it certainly doesn't come from reading capital. It certainly doesn't come from an unbiased straightforward reading of the first chapters of capital. You would never form that idea if that's what you read first. I suspect there exists a substantial number of leftists who put off reading capital for a while and during that period they prepare themselves by reading commentators. Now maybe they read Heinrich Rubin etc. It's not a good idea when you are studying any great thinker really to read the commentators before you read the, the original. You should read the original because only then will you be in a position to form a considered judgment about what the commentators are saying. Unless you yourself have first read Marx, unless you have first read Darwin, unless you first read Freud, you won't be able to assess whether these other people commentating on him or her are accurately representing what that author originally said. So read the original first. If you read the original first, this nonsense about abstract labour not existing under post-capitalist societies would never have gained any credibility. 